writing for young people gave me a lot more patience when it came to writing for oh. adults. Does being a mom even help when you write children? You know, I'll write something and say it's funny, my son will be like, that's not funny, mom. <laughs> yeah. you know? not I know, cool, stop, mom. don't Building say that. Consumer research. <laughs> yeah. I am so excited to meet Jacqueline Woodson. This is just the coolest experience. I am so super stoked about it. Being uh, an African-American woman, part of the LGBTQ community, and having those open dialogues with her was amazing. As we all know, BookTube is such a special, vibrant community of readers who come together around the love of books and reading. And how lucky are we that we get to be lucky. here with the Jacqueline Woodson. Let's just give her a round of applause. And also, shout out to Brooklyn. Yeah. Because Brooklyn. this here. is the home of so much of your work yes. and right here on this soil. So to be able to talk to you in Brooklyn is really special. Mm -hmm. You've written over 30 books. I have. You've also been the national ambassador for young people's literature for two years. No yes. big deal. I know, right? <laughs> she's yeah. you know, and back there I learned that she's always working on multiple books at a time. Oh. You write for children, you write for adults, you write for young adults, yes. you write poetry, you write picture <laughs> books, and you write novels. You yes. do it all. You know, one thing that was beautiful about Brown Girl Dreaming is that we got introduced to your early love of words. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to just hear you talk a little bit about your early love of, of writing, where it all started, and how it sort of shaped you in your career. Great question to start with. <laughs> I was a really slow reader. I still am a really slow reader. And as a kid, I got in trouble for lying all the time. <laughs> and it's interesting, I had a teacher who said instead of lying, write it down, because it's fiction. It's not a lie anymore. And I feel like that's one of the things I go back to, is that moment where um, my stories became legitimized, right? They mm. weren't something that I wasn't supposed to do anymore. Mm. They became fiction. And the fact that I grew up in a family where, you know, we weren't allowed to curse, <laughs> there were so many words we were not allowed to say, that also expanded on how powerful words were. So those were some of the early ideas around thinking about becoming mm. a writer. Mm. So Brown Girl Dream, it's a memoir about your life mm -hmm. from when you were born. Yes. What was that process like in gathering all those memories? Oh, man. I looked at a lot of pictures. I did a lot of interviews. Okay. Um, I had planned to write this whole story about coming of age as a writer mm -hmm. and just writing down every single memory I had. Mm -hmm. And then I figured when I didn't have any more memories, I'd ask my mom, I'd ask my siblings, and then I went researching for more. How long did this whole process take? That book took about four years from the time I started. Wow. Yeah, I think my editor and I stopped counting at 30 rewrites. <laughs> like, wow. there were so many poems that, because once you write it, once I had all the memories, I had to give them that narrative arc, mm -hmm. right? And then I had to go back to each verse, to each poem, and shape it so that the line breaks made sense, so that, that you wanted to go from line to line, line to, to line. line. Jacqueline, in both of your books, Brown Girl Dreaming and Red at the Bone, you see how the story sort of shifts depending on who's yes. talking and who you're asking. Kind of like real life, you yes, know? It's different yes. interpretations of the same event. Um, so can you talk about uh, your exploration of memory? My memory is the truth. <laughs> in terms of memoir, and I think that's the case for any yes. writer. With um, writing fiction, it's, it's more complicated yeah. because as the author, I kind of have to think about whose is the truth, and, and I don't always know. Is there ever a truth? I don't think there fiction? is. I don't think there is. I think there are a lot of questions, and, and I always say I write because I have questions, not because I have answers. For me, as a, as a journalist, I was trained to tell the truth, and that's why I marvel at novelists like yourself, mm -hmm. because I can appreciate a novel, but I could never imagine writing one because you're fictionalizing all of these characters. So to me, it's like magic. 
<laughs> it really is like magic. How do you how do you do it? Do these characters um, just come to you and introduce themselves in a dream? Like how does it happen for you? I have a sense of who I want to put on the page, and it doesn't always happen that way. And I kind of write asking, well, what does this character want and how are they gonna get it? And, and the truth is somewhere in there. It's a complex weaving of characters and their stories and their backstories and their desires. Mm. So we got to talk about your new novel, mm. yes. Red at the Bone. Yes. Um, it's so gorgeous. Thank you. So, just so gorgeously written. For your fans at home who have not had the opportunity yet to read Red at the Bone, Give us a little taste. Oh, man. It's uh, the story of two African-American families coming together across lines of class and across histories. And it, it's a story about loss. It's about love. It's about teenage pregnancy. It's about what it means to be a woman making certain choices at a particular time. Um, and it's about legacy. The phrase read at the bone, um, mm -hmm. you know, it comes up when Iris was first talking about her first queer relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it really struck me uh -huh. um, as a person who came out in college. Uh -huh. And you're experiencing things that maybe you felt before, but it sort of feels like the first time. Uh -huh. And I think it's such a like deeply raw experience. Uh -huh. I'm just wondering how that became this book. <laughs> that title was with me for a long time before I understood even why that was the title of the book. Mm -hmm. And when I got to Iris, who is a teenage mom who makes a decision to leave her family and go off to Oberlin, where she has her first experience with a woman, and, mm -hmm. um, and it made so much sense yeah. to me. That moment that all of us know where you're, you're, you're sliced open. Right? Like, yeah. you know, your world has changed forever because of this one other person. I mean, I hope everyone feels this at some point in yeah. their life. Yeah. This idea of being red at the bone does really hearken to the rawness of that emotion. I am Cece from the YouTube channel Problems of a Book Nerd. It's really important to know what resources are out there to make it as easy as possible for everyone to have access to queer titles. Today we're gonna to be doing some lightning round questions. Does that work for you? Yep. Okay, cool. Character in your writing that you most identify with? All of them. Character in another person's writing you most identify oh, with? Oh, I would say Francis in a Tree Grows in Brooklyn and Franny and Daddy was a numbers runner. Mm. What is your guilty pleasure? <laughs> is wine a guilty pleasure? I don't feel guilty when I drink it. No, no. So, okay, so it has to be something else that's not wine. I guess expensive wine. Expensive wine, <laughs> yeah. yeah. St still so, wine, very yes, important. Yes. <laughs> what is the strangest job you've had? I think it would probably be working at Burger King because I don't eat fast food. Mm -hmm. And maybe I don't eat fast food because I worked at Burger King. Yeah. So. <laughs> if you weren't a writer, what would you be doing? Um, I would probably be institutionalized. <laughs> so. If I had another career, I'd want to play for the um, NBA. What is your favorite word? If I had only one, I don't think I'd be a writer. That's fair. <laughs> and the last thing you do before you go to sleep? Read. Read? Yes. Same. <laughs> you have the two main characters, Poe Boy and Aubrey, mm -hmm. black fathers mm -hmm. who completely destigmatize yes. the notion that black fathers are not present, mm -hmm. they're absent, they leave their families. And it was refreshing for yeah. me to see, no, this does exist. Mm -hmm. Black fathers are around, they do raise their yes. children. Why was this important for you to write for this those, narrative? For those same reasons. As a writer, I have a deep responsibility to not only tell the truth, but to think about the bigger message I'm putting out right. there with every character I put on the page. Um, every character. Every That's single character. You know, and, and I think this comes from writing for young people. Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, who was this academic who mm -hmm. wrote a lot about children's literature, especially as it pertained to multicultural literature, mm -hmm. talked about the importance of kids having both mirrors and windows in their literature. Mm -hmm. So mirrors, so they opened a book and saw mm -hmm. a part of themselves in it and said, I could be this, wow. and windows so that they saw into other worlds. And 
You know, I think for a lot of kids of color, we got a lot more windows than we yeah. did mirrors. Yeah. That's right. And, and, and for me, it's like when someone comes to this book, what message am I giving them? What are yeah. they going to see of themselves? Mm -hmm. And I think again and again, that message of the absentee father is not the truth. It's not always the truth. There's, I know so many amazing <laughs> black dads that are there, you know, to the bone. I feel like it's almost cliche to write about a father yeah. who leaves. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and I don't want to write cliche. I want, I want to write a different kind of truth and, and the fathers who stay. And the bigger question is, how hard is it to stay in a society that has historically separated you mm -hmm. through mass incarceration, yes. you know, through murder, yes. through all the ways that family, through enslavement, mm -hmm. like all the ways that families have historically been divided? Right at the bone. It's not a tragic book, but there are yeah. these two very intense instances mm -hmm. of tragedy. Mm -hmm. And how did that happen? I think the thing about the Tulsa race massacre, I don't know how many of you all knew about it as young people. I did not. Yeah, I, did, I, I did not. not. Yeah. This huge thing happened that completely annihilated black middle class them mm -hmm. in Tulsa, but how this has historically happened, right? Mm -hmm. All these places mm -hmm. where people are like, well, how come blacks can't get it together? And it's like, duh, let's look at the yeah. history of our lives in this country and how black folks have been able to become middle class, which is a miracle, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to explore that as the beginning of the tragedy, but then also 9-11, I think, the erasure there is that people don't remember how many black and brown people Correct. were killed when the buildings came down. And I just remember being pregnant when it was happening and seeing the signs. Have you seen my son? Have you seen my husband? Have you seen my wife? She's four months pregnant. It just plastered all over the city. And so I thought I would be remiss in writing Red at the Bone that takes place around that same time and not talk about that tragedy and the impact it had on the black families, on this black family that was just as significant as the Tulsa race massacre. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We admire the conversations in the book, especially the conversations that parents, it's difficult for them to have, right? Um, this is my wife and... Mm -hmm. ah, so <laughs> so oh, look at that reveal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Married 13 years. Oh my yeah. goodness. We have three kids. Boy. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> but just even in the beginning of the story, mm -hmm. Melanie is having a mm -hmm. conversation with her mother, Iris, and uh -huh. about sex. And you can tell how uncomfortable it mm -hmm. is for Melanie. And so when we we're thinking about that. What, what made you want to <laughs> add that to the book? You know, I think one thing, because I grew up in such a religious family, talking about sex was always so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so when my partner and I decided to have kids, that was going to be intentional. I want yeah. sex to be on the table and, a, it, and it to be transparent and, and girls to know that you deserve pleasure. Yeah. You know, imagine that world where that, the conversations are out there and you're yeah. not squeamish and wanting to crawl under something. Mm -hmm. And so that's where that Melody conversation came from. Like the mom, like, OK, let's talk about <laughs> this as well as the daughter, like, oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> so. Hi, I'm Ebony from the YouTube channel Team Two Moms. Hey, you guys, it's Denise. And it's Ebony. And we are Team Two Moms. So I've learned a lot about you as the author. So my question is about the parenting side. <laughs> Our kids are being raised by two moms, and I just want to know, do you have any advice for us? Of course, there's the literature, right? Yeah. All the books that we fill their libraries with to show them that there are all kinds of ways to have yeah. family. Like, yeah. there's no one right or wrong way to have family. And I think the great thing about children's literature is there's so much out there that represents the many ways mm -hmm. we have family. I remember when my godson came home crying because yes. another kid had been like, ah, ha, 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 you have two moms. And then his mother went up oh. and she's like, well, what happened to your other mom? <laughs> <laughs> my daughter actually experienced that, oh, and I man. wish I had a yeah. good <laughs> it's like, well, only have one mom. mom it's been a while since I've read a book. Oh, that's okay. Uh, of kids. adult age. Yeah. Yeah. Our kids, our Dr. kids, Dr. Seuss. Oh, yes. <laughs> we read a lot of children's <laughs> books. What about the writing technique? I noticed that like it shifts from one character to the next character. Like, mm -hmm. is there like a specific name for this technique? Telling it from multiple points of view, mm -hmm. it, it I wanted it to feel like the saga it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it spans decades, and each person has 
such a different story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't, if I had written it from the point of view of, say, an omniscient narrator where somebody's going into everybody's head and just telling this, you know, one-sided story in this way, it didn't feel like it would work because I felt like I'd be cheating the characters who were very rich to me. And I wanted people to know they were coming into the middle of something, that yes. this wasn't the beginning. Yes, yes. yes. you could tell yeah. that so sure. it, her coming of age. Yeah, it starts with, but that. that afternoon there was an orchestra playing. Mm -hmm. So you know you're not even at the beginning of a sentence, mm -hmm. right? You're starting in the middle, middle. of lives mm -hmm. here. And, and having each person go back in and talk about their early lives or the intersections mm -hmm. of lives made that feel more truthful. Yes, I love that. My name is Denise and I am from the YouTube channel Team Two Moms. It is Team Two Moms. Peace out. We're gonna do a quick segment and it's called The Last Line. I'm gonna have you read the last line of your Ooh. book. Gleaming. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last word on the last line and it's its own sentence. And what made you end with that? It was so hopeful. Red at the Bone was such a visual book mm -hmm. for me, writing it, every scene I saw. Um, and in that moment, and there's that revelation. It just made the book so come full circle for me. What do you think your younger self would have thought about who you've become today? Mm. <laughs> I, I, I think what my younger self would say was, they're lying, you're not struggling. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think it's one of the most messed up messages we give yeah. our kids mm -hmm. that they have to read fast. When, as you know, it takes us forever to write these books, mm -hmm. right? And we don't want people mm -hmm. speeding through them. Mm -hmm. We want them to spend time. You know, oh. I was reading the same things over oh, and over, over mm -hmm. and over mm -hmm. again until they were like a part of me, that they, they were, um, you know, I had them memorized, mm -hmm. and I deeply understood them. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't going to happen from reading really quickly. Like, uh, I want to read every you single have to word. feel it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you want to slow slip slow. every sentence. <laughs> no. yes. I'm stealing that. Yeah. Yes, I'm stealing that, too. I don't know about you guys, but I just feel like the greatest joy of reading is when it can be done in community, yeah. when a book becomes part of a shared experience. So mm -hmm. just thank you guys for being thank here. You. Thank you for having me. And bringing thank your you brilliant good. questions. And Jacqueline, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you for your you work. So thank you for your love. Thank you for oh. your presence today. Thank you. It's been an honor. This has been so fun. <laughs> I'm loving these now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs>